Okay. Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Any questions to begin with? Any questions? Okay, uh, yes, please. Oh, like uh, we have a quiz in our next practical. How do we know the syllabus that will be tested for that quiz? So the, the quiz for the labs is based on the lab handout. And whatever is covered, so you can see it as a pre-lab. And uh, in fact, there was a question in Piazza. What kind of questions should I expect? I have compiled the quiz, and therefore I have posted on Piazza a type of a question. So uh, it should be an easy, basically conceptual quiz. Some people have taken it already. I advise that they don't share the information about what it is. But uh, it doesn't involve any heavy calculations like integration over a volume or anything like that. It's mainly conceptual. OK? Any other questions? All right. Um, so I will continue a little bit today with Gauss's law and the examples uh, that I'd like to show you. Uh, so the main point I want to make is that Gauss's law is a law. It's universally true no matter what surface you apply it to and what charge distributions are involved. However, it is useful to calculate electric fields from charge distributions only in very limited cases where there is there are symmetries in the problem that would allow you to determine the general form of the field, uh, specifically a form of the field where the field will uh, point in a direction defined by one unit vector and would depend on one coordinate. In that case, you can define a surface uh, and easily calculate the field. So unless you can express it in terms of one function that depends on one coordinate, Gauss's law holds universally, but it's not useful to calculate the field. That is the point. So here are some examples where actually this nice combination uh, does exist. The first one is the one that we uh, saw in the last lecture, and that is the constant line charge density along the z-axis. And in this case, we had argued that the field will have to have one component. Uh, and uh, I'd like to remind you that we have to think about the direction of the field and which coordinate it depends upon separately. So first of all, I will think about the direction. And the argument that we had presented was that if I have an observation point here, P, and it has some coordinates in the cylindrical coordinate system, R phi z, then the total field that is observed at that point is a superposition of fields created by point charges on the distribution. However, for any point charge like this, I can find another point charge symmetrically placed so that this triangle is isosceles that will generate another field in this direction. And if you vectorially add the two fields, let me get P out of the uh, way. So if you vectorially add the fields, the z component actually cancels out, and you have only a radial component. So here, the electric field points in the radial direction. So that is the first uh, uh, thing that we saw. Let me put the p back here, the observation point. Okay. So it is in the radial direction. And the second thing that you can argue about this distribution, this charge distribution, is that if you were moving up and down, that is, you were, uh, you imagine this observation point P. And sorry, this is a Z. Phi Z. OK. So if you imagine that you okay, were changing every other coordinate except for the radial coordinate. And R measures the distance of this point from the z-axis. That is what the R coordinate is in the cylindrical coordinate system. So if you imagine moving this point up and down, so let's say this is a drone and moves up and down, changes its z-coordinate, it would see exactly the same charge distribution. 
And that means that it sees the same source everywhere as it moves, it, as it changes its z-coordinate. So if it sees the same source, it should see the same effect of that source, which is a field. And that means that the field cannot depend on the z-coordinate. So theta by theta z here is 0. And if you imagine this point moving on a circle around the axis, it would also see no difference. It's just like uh, having a concrete tower, cylinder, and you are moving around it. You don't know which way you are looking at it because everywhere you go on a circle around that concrete cylinder, you just see a piece of concrete going up to the sky. So you don't see any difference in the sources. That means you don't see any difference in the effect of the sources, which are the fields. So therefore, I should not have any phi dependence in the problem. Theta by theta phi should be 0. And that means that I have an electric field that can only depend on the radial coordinate. So this is a problem where you have cylindrical symmetry. And cylindrical symmetry means, you, you see, practically, in this course, we have three forms of symmetry. Rectangular, cylindrical, spherical. If you have cylindrical, for Gauss's law, the surface you need to choose is a cylinder. For rectangular symmetry, we will see it later, a box. For a spherical, a sphere. So it is really boils down to these three possibilities. And therefore, I will go and, so this is the case where Gauss's law applies. You have an electric field pointing in one direction and depending on one variable. And uh, therefore, this is a case where Gauss's law can be used to find the exact form of this one unknown function. Well, how we apply the law on a cylinder. And I'd like to give you some more uh, details about this, since we made it towards the end of the lecture on uh, Thursday to this point. So here is a cylinder. Okay, so this is the cylinder, radius r, and I place it from z equal 0 to z equal l. And Gauss's law says that if I take the closed path integral over this surface of the cylinder, that will be equal to the enclosed charge divided by the dielectric permittivity of free space, because we are doing this calculation still in free space. So now, um, we know that the electric field will be pointing in the radial direction. Like this. Out of the cylinder. However, one thing that I'd like to emphasize uh, with respect to the uh, Thursday lecture is that Gauss's law holds in a closed surface. So here, this integral has to be carried out over the top, the bottom, and the cylindrical surrounding surface. Okay, so now if you go to your um, aid sheet, this ds in cylindrical coordinates has three uh, possibilities. It has three expressions there. If you look at your aid sheet, the first is r. 
R d phi dz. So if you go to your age sheet, you will see that. The second is phi d r dz. And the third is z hat uh, r d phi d r. So these are the three possibilities. What are these vectors? So which one should we choose for each surface? This cylindrical surface, all the points on that surface have a fixed r. So therefore, everything that contains dr on the top and the bottom is actually 0. So for the top and the bottom, let's say for surfaces 1 and 2, uh, sorry, I was uh, talking about the cylindrical surface. Let me call this 1 and this 2 and this 3. Okay. So for 1, the only possibility that ds would be useful for you is this one because it only contains d phi and dz. So this is the right um, ds for this surface. It is the r d phi uh, dz in the radial direction. So this one, actually, if you want to visualize it, it will be a surface that uh, has a dz height, and it has a width that is r d phi. So it is defined by this arc length uh, here, r radius, and this is d phi. So this is the surface. But that is if you want to visualize it. You don't need to, and all you need to uh, understand is how to choose which vector is appropriate here for the DS. So for the cylindrical surface, the one that you need to choose is this one. So which one is the DS for number two? So number two, you see, is a surface with fixed Z, Z equal L. So any guesses? Yes. Uh, that uh, the third one. That's right. And you see that also, I mean, by inspection, right? It has to point in the z direction. So this ds will be uh, z hat r d phi dr. And last one is this one. ds here should be r d phi uh, z, uh, minus z hat r d phi dr, because this ds points always outwards, always outwards. So Gauss defines this ds pointing outwards. I was asked about this. Why? Because uh, this expression here is basically a flux. So when you are measuring flux, from a fountain, let's say, where the water comes out, then that flux should be positive because the fountain generates water. Okay, the sink absorbs water. Uh, so in that case, you have you should have a negative flux. So that's why here this dot product is being taken with a ds that points outwards. So that the result is positive if the electric field is coming out of the surface instead of going into the surface. This hydrodynamic analog. Uh, should be making sense, hopefully. So if you remember on Thursday, I did not actually talk at all about the top and the bottom. Any guesses why? Yes. They cancel each other out. Sorry? They cancel out. The they don't cancel out. Actually, there is no flux through the top and the bottom. You see, the electric field flows parallel to both the top and the bottom. Imagine that you have a stream of water and you are holding a bucket like this. So the water goes like this. You are holding the bucket like this. Nothing ends up within the bucket. Right? You have to actually turn the bucket towards the water stream in order to collect water. If the water comes like this, your bucket has to be like this so that you collect the water. If your bucket is like this, the water just passes uh, over the bucket and you collect zero. So that's exactly what happens at the top and the bottom. Now, if you want to see this mathematically, 
and I always uh, appreciate quantitative arguments before intuitive arguments. Many times uh, you will see also in your textbook that um, they try to solve problems by intuition or by inspection or I tell you by inspection this happens and I understand that this needs time so that you develop the intuition to um, do this inspection. So let me just quantitatively show that in surface one where ds is r hat e dot ds is equal to e r of r r hat dot r hat r d phi d z. Okay, so now you have a dot product r dot r, which is one. Remember the dot, the dot product is a for uh, unit vectors in an orthogonal coordinate system is a binary variable. So if you take the dot product of the vector with itself, it's one. If you take the dot product of the vector, the unit vector with any other vector, then it is zero. So here we have this r dot r, which is equal to one. And that agrees with our intuition that there is flux through the cylindrical surface. For surface two, We have now that ds in the z direction. So e dot ds Okay? So now you have r dot z. So that gives you zero. And indeed that mathematically shows what we had seen already from the picture, that there is no flux of the electric field through either, through this top surface. So that's why I uh, right away disregarded that on Thursday. And then finally, uh, for the third surface, the bottom, it's minus z hat r d phi dr, and again, e dot ds is zero. So there is only flux through the cylinder on the sides. And how much is the enclosed Q? We also showed that on uh, Thursday, that will be RL times L, the length that is enclosed by the cylinder. So you see the charge enclosed is only here. So we have a density Rosa Bell. Over length L. Okay, let's uh, get restarted. Just give me a moment to get my chalk out. So I was about to finish this example, which is anyway a review example. And uh, I'm ready now to apply the law, as you see, this uh, closed integral, closed surface integral, will actually boil down to two zero terms for the top and the bottom faces, and then just one term over the cylindrical surface, where e dot ds will be e r of r, r d phi dz. So you see we're integrating with respect to d phi and dz. So now, instead of having here the index 1 for the surface, I will put the bounds of the two variables. Phi goes from 0 to 2 pi because there is no restriction. We can go all the way from 0 to 2 pi. And then dz will go from 0 to l. So you see here the classical situation with Gauss's law, when Gauss's law is useful for calculating fields. You have simply an integration that is trivial. These things depend on R only, so they are not integrated. They can be taken out of the integral. 
And then I have inside just 0 to L dz, 0 to 2 pi d phi. And that is equal to 2 pi L. OK, so these are uh, trivial integrals. And finally, I have 2 pi r L times E r of r. And if you want to understand this intuitively, what is 2 pi r times L? It's the area of the curve surface. It's the surface. The A is, indeed, it's the area of this cylindrical surface. So that is what Gauss law is about when it works for calculating fields. The electric field is constant on a surface, and then you basically multiply that constant electric field times the surface area. So this is nothing else but the area of the surface. If you had the intuition, you could do this by inspection as well. So therefore, this says 2 pi r l e r equals to q enclosed, which is rho l times l. You see that the lengths cancel out, and that's why you shouldn't be afraid of introducing auxiliary variables like the length of the surface of the cylinder here, because it canceled out. Obviously, it was something I uh, put into the problem, and then it cancels out naturally, and the electric field is what we had already known. And there was an epsilon not here. Uh, So this is the field that we had already found before. So any questions for those who are working in? This is all review material just uh, on steroids uh, 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 with some added details based on questions I received in last lecture. Yes? Uh, just to confirm, so the reason we're doing this is because we don't know the charge at a specific observation point. So we'd have to enclose it and then find, uh, and then use the electric field of that. There is no charge at the observation point. Yeah, yeah, there's no charge at the other. So that's why, and because we know, don't know the charge, we'd have to go through the Gauss's law to No, I don't know the field. <coughs> the, the charge is given. The charge distribution is the line charge. This is about calculating the electric field, right? It's calculating this. So second example. Now let's see a situation where we have a, a volume, a, s a spherical uh, charge distribution. So this is a volume charge density, rho sub v. which is equal to a constant for r less than a and 0 for r greater than a. So we have a, basically a charge that, that is distributed in a sphere. So we have uh, now a spherically symmetric problem. I can make it a negative charge. And if I uh, put some numbers there, I will give this uh, charge density the value of 1.74 or minus 1.74 times 10 to the 44 Coulomb per meter cubed. Okay, And I will give the radius alpha, the value of 2.8, 10 to minus 15 meters. Anybody can guess how much charge there is inside there? What is the calculation I need to make? Constant charge density over a sphere. Hint, no integration is needed. So you can do this. Uh, the area of the sphere into that. The volume of the sphere, yeah. So the total Q 
the total Q is this minus 1.74 times 10 to the 44 times the volume 4 third pi a cubed. And if you do this calculation, you will find minus 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs. Coulomb. So uh, this is a model for the electron. Instead of having the electron as a point charge, I now go and dig inside and I represent it as a volume charge density. Remember, the field of a point charge is Q, Q divided by 4 pi epsilon not R squared. Nobody yelled at me about this. When r goes to zero, the field goes to infinity. Physical quantities should not diverge to infinity. Whenever you see such a divergence, that is a side effect of some non-physical assumption. And here, the non-physical assumption is that everything reduces to a point. Well, obviously, that is not entirely true. Uh, there is a radius 10 to minus 15, or of course, quantum physics tells us that you cannot pin down the electron, but you know its whereabouts with some uncertainty. So uh, this is a simplified model that will allow us to do a useful calculation. I have posted a note in, uh, on Quercus that shows that if I have generally cylindrically symmetric charge distributions, this form of the field can be assumed immediately for, cylindric, for any cylindrically symmetric charge distributions. For any, for any spherically symmetric charge distributions, the electric field can be immediately assumed to be radially symmetric. So you see again, I have an electric field that lends itself to applying Gauss's law. Because again, it has this simplified form, points along the direction of one unit vector and uh, depends on one coordinate. So in this case, I have to be very careful and separate the points inside the sphere from the points outside the sphere. So I will take two cases. So definitely, I have this case where I can apply Gauss's law to find ER inside and outside. So that's exactly what I will do. So case one is if I am inside the sphere. Uh, so the, uh, the charge is distributed in this sphere. Anybody can guess what should be the surface where I apply now Gauss's law? should be a sphere. So it will be a sphere, however, inside the, will be a sphere like this, inside the uh, charge distribution. So I take a sphere of radius r, less than the radius of this electron charge. Okay, so I am inside. So what is the enclosed charge by the sphere? I have to repeat the same calculation, but now instead of putting the total radius of the charge, I will put the radius now of the green sphere because only this one encloses the charge. So that will be 4 thirds pi r cubed. What is the ds that I have? That's how the ds should look like. It should be pointing 
normally to the sphere. And from your aid sheet, the only vector that does that is the one that starts with an R hat. Again, if you want to quickly figure out which one you choose, right? You look at the field. The, the surface vector you need for Gauss's law is the one that points in the direction of the field, because that's the one that will collect flux. The other ones will be perpendicular and will give you zero. So you see, even before in the cylinder, when I have the R, the Z, the phi vectors, I could, of course, I went and I, because I teach this course, and I want to show you the step-by-step -step situation. I went and tested the Z and the R, and I could have tested the phi. I didn't have a phi surface here. But if you want to do this quick, then simply you say the electric field points in R hat. So I pick the vector that will give me flux, which will have to be the r hat vector. And that one looks like r hat r squared sine theta d theta d phi, which is also great because it doesn't have any dr. I am on a sphere. I should not be varying my radial coordinate. And that means that e dot ds on the sphere will be er of r r hat dot r hat. Again, that is what I want to see. A, a dot product that gives me one, r squared sine theta d theta d phi. So then Gauss's law says that er of r, r squared sine theta d theta d phi should be equal to q enclosed four thirds pi r cubed divided by, uh, of course, times the density, sorry, times the density, I forgot this here, times the density divided by epsilon naught. You see again, same situation as before. These are constants on the sphere. So the electric field depends only on distance r. So if you fix r, because you are integrated on the sphere, the electric field becomes constant. That's exactly what, where Gauss's law should be applicable. So you take this out. And if we want to be, again, quick about this integral, what will that give us? It will give us the surface of the sphere, 4 pi r squared. So this is r squared. This first integral on sine theta d theta will give you 2. And this 0 to 2 pi d phi will give you a 2 pi. So the result will be 2 pi times 2 times r squared, 4 pi r squared. And this is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed, rho naught by epsilon naught. So you see now that if you adopt this model for the electron charge, the electric field does not have the singularity anymore. It doesn't go to infinity when r goes to infinity. You will see that uh, if you solve this equation, r squared will cancel out partially with r cubed. And this 4 pi will cancel out with this 4 pi. And you get that the electric field is equal to rho naught by 3 epsilon naught r. So you see it doesn't have this 1 over r squared dependence anymore. If you evaluate this at r equals 0, it will give you 0. Not No singular model anymore. And uh, finally, you can repeat this uh, outside the sphere. Anybody can guess how the field would look like if uh, I repeat this on a second surface that is outside the sphere? 
outside the charge? Zero. Zero? Um, but I have enclosed charge. Yes. Yes. So in this case, you can confirm this that it will be q by 4 pi epsilon not r squared, where q is the total charge of the sphere. So in this case now, we are reconciling our model with the point charge model. Because if you go away, if you increase your r, then you should be seeing this as a point charge. So if you want to plot this er, and I will put the absolute value here. As you understand, it's a negative charge, and therefore it will be negative. But just to so it grows here as proportionally to r, and then here decays as 1 over r squared. OK, so this is the second example. I owe you. One more example, with, which we will do on, uh, on Wednesday. So thanks for your attention. Sorry for uh, all the interruptions. See you on Wednesday. I will stick